welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly KPFA public affairs program that brings you news and analysis of environmental and social justice issues from around the SF Bay Area, from around the state of California, from across North America, and indeed from around the world. As a matter of fact, today's Terra Verde show features John Bartlett, an independent journalist who is based in Santiago de Chile. As a theme of this year's Terra Verde shows, we have on several occasions discussed events surrounding the Estallido Social, the ongoing social explosion in Chile, whose one-year anniversary has just passed. To continue that coverage of the uprising in Chile and right on the cusp of the upcoming Sunday, October 25 plebiscite vote on whether or not Chile will pursue a new constitution, I was able to connect this week with a special guest, an independent journalist who has been covering Chile throughout all of the events of the past couple of years. John Bartlett, based in Santiago, a witness to history in the making, and joining us today on Terra Verde. Welcome, John, to KPFA Terra Verde. How are you doing today? Very well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. It's really an honor, John, to have you on Terra Verde to provide some insights from what's happening on the ground in Chile. But let's start the show, John, with you giving a little bit of background about your work and make sure that right away we also share information for listeners to find your reporting in the future. So if you could just tell us a bit about yourself and your career as a journalist and how you end up in Chile at this historic time. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I ended up in Chile almost by accident, really. That was never really uh, the plan. Um, Latin America was always my sort of, um, you know, my my sort of main area of interest in the sort of politics and, you know, relations between all the countries and things. That's what I was really interested in. Uh, I did a master's uh, in Latin American studies back in the UK. And then I came out to Chile to initially to work for the UN, uh, which I did for a few months. And then after that, I, um, I started reporting, really. So that was back in uh, January 2018 uh, that I arrived here. Uh, for the first time and I uh, and I, yeah I started writing about um, the first article I did was about this sort of feminist uh, wave of feminist takeovers uh, throughout Chile um, but I reported from Santiago and I went and kind of you know went to all these sit-ins and spent the evening talking to, to people around campfires and things sort of uh, in their faculty grounds and, and talking to people about kind of why um, why they thought that this, uh, this is sort of patriarchy was uh, was governing the country so that was my sort of introduction um, a bit of a baptism of fire to the sort of the, the protest uh, side of things here in Chile. Uh, and then, yeah, from then on, I've just been reporting ever since on, on various topics of environmental things, uh, lots of politics, uh, some current affairs as well when uh, when things happen, although Chile's not always, uh, you know, kind of centre of attention around the world. And, yeah, if you'd like to follow this sort of the reporting I do, then my Twitter handle is probably the best place to find things, and that'd be at jwbartlett92. Uh, so yeah, that's where I post most of the things that I do, and I put little videos up of the protests and things, which is um, you know obviously quite an, an important way of showing people what's going on here at the moment. Because I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of kind of misinformation flying around, which I think is uh, important to, to to rectify. But I think that's uh, something you're probably quite familiar with in the US at the moment as well. Yeah, well, countering that misinformation is why it's such an honor to have you on KPFA with us, and we'll make sure that we touch on things like your Twitter handle and your website as we wrap up the show, so that listeners can find a way. Way to be checking out your reporting even in real time right now. I think it's really significant that you bring up immediately the feminist essence of much of this uh, social movement in Chile right now. I think um, this kind of uh, indicates that there's a lot going on in Chile that really mm -hmm. should be of interest and, and is of interest to people in California and in, in the United States. Um, so can we um, actually, just make sure that listeners know fully what's happening. Can you kind of briefly capture, uh, you know, we know, you know, quote unquote, there was a social uprising or however folks might want to describe it in Chile, this amazing rebellion. Um, but now we're heading towards this plebiscite vote. Can you kind of quickly capture for listeners what's happening? And I think we'll keep going 
violent, visceral, kind of uh, cathartic uh, revolt, really, uh, against the neoliberal system, uh, against these sort of perceived injustices, um, uh, sort of inequalities in kind of every level of society, really, you know, in every kind of, you know, they talk about environmental uh, matters, you talk about feminism, uh, the role of women in society. Um, there are so many different things that people uh, almost, in, and they use this kind of this terminology about uh, Chile waking up uh, this, on the 18th of October, Chile, Chile awoke, uh, which is a really interesting and maybe a little bit of a romantic way of putting it. But it's, um, you know, in, in thousands, of, in millions of people over the course of the next few months kind of flooded onto the streets uh, and, and started, to, started to voice these concerns. And, and Chilean society, is, as, you, as you know, having spent time here, is a... Uh, um, it's very interesting. It's quite sort of, it's quite closed. People are quite reserved, particularly here in the in in, in the capital. Um, but people, for for the first time, and in, in certainly in my time in Chile, and I'd have been been here for a couple of years at, at that point. Um, you know, people were, people were talking to each other. People were sharing. People were kind of you know for the first time starting to uh, talk about all these things that it seemed that everyone had kind of been thinking about at the same time. And so basically, kind of wealth, uh, influence, power, uh, and 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 all, and all sorts of kind of you know this you know this sort of uh, elite that had formed in Chile. All of it had been concentrated in a really kind of small, insulated uh, kind of e uh, political and economic class, uh, which which was basically running the country. And people for a long time hadn't had a voice, and they found one on the 18th of October uh, 2019. And so that's probably you know the most sort of romantic way of putting it. And it, and it was there were, you know there were parts of it that were that were uh, incredibly interesting to to be here to witness and to you know kind of mingle with all these people who were uh, sharing all these thoughts for the. For almost the first time um, but you know you've got to you've got to look back to where that's come from and Chile returned to democracy after the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet uh, in 1990 um, and that was you know that was another moment where you, you ended up kind of you know the, the whole country uh, changed you know and, you know sort of back to back to democracy there was a, again another sort of catharsis at the time where people um, people started to share and kind of talk about the, the nearly 17 years of sort of brutal repressive uh, autocratic rule that has that preceded that moment so you know from then on there was huge amounts of economic growth i think between uh 1990 and 2018 uh gdp per capita uh grew i think it was about 200 and 252 percent i think it was so there was ostensibly or at least superficially uh huge economic growth and and um and the sort of proponents of of neoliberalism and the sort of capitalist model that chile has adopted to um to real extremes have, have always pointed to those uh to those things um, um, but the, the the reality of it was that those those numbers were sort of masking the reality on the streets for a lot of people. Um, you know, a lot of people weren't actually benefiting uh, from this kind of supposed um, uh, progress. And obviously, it depends how we define progress. But the progress that was being made in here in Chile, and 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 yeah, I think that was that was what really kind of led to this 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 moment where everyone started to 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 you know kind of confide in one another that they'd all been feeling the same. And this sort of extreme privatization of of uh, every aspect of life was. Um, perhaps, perhaps it is sustainable in, in some uh, in some contexts, but it didn't seem to be in Chile. And uh, there's always been a very, a very vociferous sort of protest. Um kind of, uh, uh, maybe it's not a mentality, but, you know, kind of, you know, a tradition of protest here in Chile. The, the, uh, the resistance to the dictatorship is, is well documented and a lot of people um, uh, a lot of people were, um, you know, heavily involved in that, both in exile uh, outside, of, outside of Chile uh, and, and, and here as well. So that's always been there, that, that side of things and, uh, and yeah, I think when, when the time came and people started to actually uh, rise up and, and, um, and, and came out into the streets last October, that was, you know, it was all in evidence. It was a, it was a fascinating time to, to be here with a lot of kind of uh, echoes of the past as well. And then it was after nearly a month of just really persistent street presence and an increasing articulation of uh, these environmental injustices and economic injustices that the, you know, Chilean people were suddenly rising mm -hmm. up against. Then there was this political agreement that was made um, to actually have a vote on the possibilities of forming a new constitution. Can you describe a little bit about how that evolved and then how it is now that the vote is finally occurring um, on Sunday, October 25th? Yeah, so... Um 
you know, that was something that kind of evolved throughout the movement. No, people didn't kind of, you know, pour onto the streets saying that they wanted a new constitution, although that, that movement had been building uh, for a long time as well. There's, uh, there's been kind of uh, small kind of uh, ripples of dissent that have, uh, have uh, you know, been directed towards the constitution, but it's always been reformed. Uh, it's, it's also been reformed several times in 1989 and 2005, most, uh, most significantly. Um, but just a bit of context about the constitution. It was, it was signed, it was ratified by this um, disputed, uh, to put it mildly, referendum uh, in 1980. But it was also drafted uh, without any kind of democratic input, without any popular input, uh, um, by a, t- a team of kind of uh, General Pinochet's closest confidants, led by uh, Jaime Guzman, who was a formidably conservative lawyer and, uh, and politician who was actually assassinated, I think, in 1991 um, by members of the Manuel Rodriguez Patriotic Front, who were a sort of urban um, guerrilla movement here in Santiago, a sort of communist movement. Um, so, I mean, it's incredibly controversial document in itself but what it does is enshrine um, the kind of the sanctity of private property uh, it privatises it a lot, uh, it kind of, you know, paves the way for the privatisation of a lot of different things. It has huge, it has kind of glaring emissions as well in terms of um, kind of social welfare and social rights. So, for example, the uh, the right to housing in Chile isn't enshrined by the constitution, which it is in, uh, in 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 other in other constitutions in the region. And um, and and this, also the indigenous side of things as well. The Chile's uh, nine nine recognised indigenous uh, communities at the moment are are recognised by the indigenous law uh, that came. Uh, shortly after the return to democracy uh, but they're not recognised by the constitution which only refers to Chileans as, as the people with uh, with sovereignty in Chile so that's an interesting side of things as well and basically this, um, you know, there's been uh, resistance to the, to the constitution people have wanted to change it for, uh, for a really long time, particularly on the left um, here in Chile and and yeah, so on the 15th of November there was an accord signed between all of the uh, the heads of the parties uh, in, in in Chile uh, to, to work towards a, a referendum uh, which was originally, I think, going to be on the 25th of April or 26th of April, I think it was this year, and obviously that was uh, pers- uh, postponed until uh, after some of you know, the quarantines are, are largely lifted throughout most of the country now, although some uh, some areas do remain in quarantine. Um, and yeah, so on the 25th of October, Chile is going to vote on a on a new constitution. There are going to be two ballot papers given out. The uh, first one uh, says. Would you would you like a new constitution? I approve or or I reject. Are the two uh, two options you, you've got there? And then there are two constitutional bodies possible as well. So people are going to choose which of those that they're going to uh, they're going to want on the uh, on the on the second uh, second ballot paper. And without going into too much detail, because it's not massively interesting, um, the first uh, the first is a mixed con- uh, convention, which would be half sitting parliamentarians elected and half uh, of the of the body elected from civil society and anyone can put themselves forward as an independent candidate to form part of the constitutional body and then the other option which is the one that's leading in the polls at the moment and i should say that the um the process the um the option to draft a new constitution is also leading in the polls um the other body would be entirely elected from civil society and that would be on an 11th of april uh, uh referendum next uh, election next year so it's, it's it's a very interesting time to be here people are really starting to uh, to talk about it people uh, in 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 some cases but but not all are very kind of well educated on the constitution which i i don't think is the case in in, in all countries but people here are very kind of politically active uh, and very much involved in in, in what's going on well, you're hearing from John Bartlett, an independent reporter based in Santiago de Chile, who's joined us on Terra Verde today to give us this uh, excellent and detailed um, you know, summary of, of what is happening in Chile right now, which uh, those of us who've been close to uh, environmental justice work in Chile and human rights work uh, over the years, we know that this is a very, very significant moment um, but maybe, John, we can just, you know, ask you from your experience as, um, as a reporter and as a student of Latin America, is, is this really as historical mo- moment as we think it is? Or are we just getting caught up in the romance of the moment? Um, and then, you know, uh, here in the States, it's um, sometimes hard to get any bandwidth on a lot of things that are going in other parts of the world. And Chile's not often on everyone's radar but this is potentially significant but what do you, how significant do you think this moment really is yeah, I, I think it's it's a bit half and half, really. I think that it's easy to romanticise what's going on here in Chile at the moment, and and, and people are doing, and uh, to an extent. But I also think that yeah, there's there's 
It's obviously huge significance for Chile. I mean, this is, you know, if you, if you take it at, at, um, at face value, it's a chance to, uh, to really kind of close a chapter uh, here for the country. People are going to be able to vote on the, one of the, the few sort of remaining vestiges of the, of the Pinochet dictatorship. And, uh, and for many, uh, well, they're hoping to, to replace it and kind of move ahead with a, uh, a different model, although I'm not sure quite how different the model is going to be that they, they end up with because, you know, constitutional reform doesn't have, um, doesn't have the best track record for, for implementing sort of you know profound change in in many contexts um so i think there's a lot riding on it the expectations are absolutely huge uh, i think that's dangerous uh, in some ways but i think it's uh, you know carrying people forward uh, certainly in others but um but yeah i think if you put it into the global context as well obviously we're going to have um you know if if on sunday chile votes to to form a new a new constitution um then it's going to be the world's sort of newest constitutional project and i think that it's a it's a conversation that's going on in in a lot of countries around uh, around the world at the moment the sort of you know the sort of the the vanguard of this conversation on the future of capitalism how it works um you know chile's a, an, an extractive economy as well as a you know it, it relies on its on its copper its uh, uh, its mining exports um forestry is another big sector here agricultural the agricultural sector as well obviously um you know i think there's some kind of uh, understanding of what goes on in uh, in chile and california through, through the the avocado trade so there's a lot of uh, kind of places here in the sort, of, the sort of arid central valleys of Chile uh, where they grow avocados just li- uh, literally for the foreign markets and they all go to uh, to Europe and a lot to the, to the west coast of, uh, of the US as well um, so, so yeah I think that you know we're all having this we're all having this conversation at the moment we're starting to uh, to discuss uh, what 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 the model is doing to the planet particularly but but what it's doing to societies as well and so I think that, that you know from from that kind of from that angle and I'm not sure everyone would agree with it but I think from that angle it is an interesting um, an interesting moment with sort of global ramifications as well because if Chile does uh, does end up having a constitution which takes it in a different direction then I think that you've um, you know you've got you've got something that could almost kind of provide a benchmark for for the, you know kind of the future of that conversation so yeah I think it's I think it's hugely significant but you know it's also very difficult to to, to say at the moment you know there's um there are sort of stipulations that were part of that agreement on the 15th of november to to, to draft a new constitution such as uh, any bill that is going to be included in this in whatever this document whatever form this document takes uh if they vote for a new constitution uh needs uh, any do- any kind of bill that w- would be in- included would need a two-thirds majority of the constitutional uh convention to be included so i mean that that is going to you know have mean there's going to be a considerable veto on both the left and the right and so we could end up with quite a scant sort of a constitution that, that won't even then pass the exit referendum which is going to be held uh, about a year after they start drafting it so so yeah there's a, there's a huge there's a long way to go I mean Chile hasn't even hasn't even voted to, um, to, to to write a new constitution yet although the polls do suggest that uh, that's the the, the favourite option at the moment but yeah I think it's, it's a long way to go but I think it's certainly certainly significant uh, for Chile and you know potentially globally as well mm, that's really exciting to have you on KPFA to get your insights on on all of this and it's really important i think to have a sober perspective even as everyone i would hope is going to be very closely attuned to results coming out of the vote on sunday Uh, john i kind of want to make a pivot to a theme that isn't necessarily really uh, the heart and soul of terra verde work where we tend to really focus on environmental questions and I, i think there are probably some environmental justice aspects of this question, but I wanted to look a little bit at, um, you know, the importance of your reporting on the concerns around human rights violations in Chile, and in particular, I think KPFA listeners would be, you know, really interested in learning about how this social uprising in Chile right now really can also be seen in the context of a, a total rebellion against police brutality can you share with us a little bit of, of, of your reporting some you know specific cases like uh the caso pio nono that you had a chance to report on recently or other elements around these violations of human rights and and how uh, the chilean people really are um rising up against the carabineros the national police in chile yeah, so I, th- I think it's a really interesting side of it. And I think it's a really important one to uh, to kind of you know discuss as well. Um, so I mean, just to sort of you know, set the scene a little bit, those first you know first few weeks after uh, the sort of social social movement kicked off on the 18th of October, um, you know there was there was there was you know there was there was 
joy in the air, but also a huge amount of fear. You know, more than 30 people were killed, uh, many in suspicious circumstances, and not all by the Carabineros, many by, uh, or a handful as well, by, by the military who were called onto the streets. And so we're, we're talking today on the, on the 20th of October, which is actually the, the anniversary of uh, President Sebastián Piñera coming on to, you know, addressing the nation, coming on to television uh, to declare that Chile was at war with a, a powerful uh, and unforgiving enemy, which was, uh, you know, it was it was frightening for a lot of people to hear because this is the sort of the rhetoric of the of the dictatorship, and I don't think anyone was really expecting that. And that was a, you know, the, the president made a huge number of mistakes over the over the the weeks that would come. But I think that was a that was a really important one, and that was projected around the world, and people, you know, kind of wholeheartedly rejected that because even people that weren't in favour of the, um, you know, some of some people's kind of forms of protest, and there was some violence uh, certainly from. Uh, from some of the from some of the protesters, um, even people that, that were you know condemning that were also you know frightened to hear the president come out and declare declare war on a sort of unknown enemy basically. Um, but it's, it started the conversation all of these all of these incidents uh, on police reform here. The Carabineros were one of the symbols of the the repression of the dictatorship as well, and they they reformed uh, um, fairly fairly comprehensively after the return to democracy. They changed their uniforms, for example, so now they wear this sort of bottle green uniform which uh, now looks decidedly sort of military. Um, now you see them on the streets a lot and they're, they're heavily armed. There were, um, you know, th- uh, h- hundreds of cases of, uh, of uh, eye injuries that are incurred, uh, reported on brilliantly by the, by the New York Times at one point. And there's a, a video that I recommend anyone should, uh, should, should look up, um, uh, which shows, you know, talked to a few of the victims and it was, it was, they were largely caused by the police firing kind of these, these uh, in inverted commas, non-lethal projectiles uh, at, directly at the faces of, uh, of protesters. Um, and those included these, these sort of uh, rubber bullets, which are sort of marble sized and they, they claimed that they were in, entirely rubber, but I think they did some analysis and some found that they had metal components in as well. Uh, sort of independent laboratories looked at those. There are also these kind of uh, uh, sort of shotgun pellets as well that they were firing at, at, at protesters' faces. And, you know, when that kind of thing happens, um, it's, it's very, very difficult to to, to see any course apart from you know kind of profound uh, police reform, which was something that was already on the table. I mean, there are there are allegations of, of torture and sexual abuse as well levelled against the police. Um, recently, these things have started to come to trial. There was a there was a case I think last week or the week before, uh, which came to trial here in Santiago in one of the uh, in a, a district called Peñalolén. Uh, there were uh, four I think I think there were five young young people arrested. The youngest was fourteen, uh, and uh, they were tortured by police who. Uh, basically had uh, taken the, the, the kind of irritant powder out of a tear gas canister and smeared it onto the faces of these people while they were handcuffed uh, and things like that and you know just you know real kind of uh, it sounds sort of kind of inhuman you know some of the treatment that you uh, that you've seen uh, you know could have come to light through all these cases and the lawyers are working kind of tirelessly they have been doing for a year now uh, to bring all of these cases to trial and that's that is starting to happen but but yeah I think the conversation then started again very recently as you, as you mentioned um, on the the Pio Nono Bridge, which is the bridge that links the sort of uh, the sort of uh, um, historic sort of party area of Santiago to the uh, the main square where protesters have been congregating over the last year. Um, there was a boy who was uh, fleeing from protesters. Uh, he'd been involved in this sort of you know this sort of violence or sort of skirmishes on the on the outskirts of the of the of the protest uh, of the protest, uh, and he was fleeing from from police. And he was kind of tackled and bundled over the railings by a um, by one of the Carabineros. Uh, officers and so yeah we, we reported on that he fell down into the sort of the, the concrete channel of the of the Mapocho River which if you've been to Santiago it's it's not a very not a very beautiful river it's a, a sort of a, a concrete gully with uh, muddy water at the bottom and he and then he fell in there and was he was dragged out of the river unconscious by, by fellow protesters and then treated by um, by these sort of uh, brigades of uh, emergency rescuers that have formed of uh, volunteers around the protest so it, it was it was incredible it was incredibly shocking you know that the videos that were that were filtering onto social media a year ago and they're still filtering onto um, onto the um you know, onto Twitter and Instagram, particularly now, um, you know, it's it's incredibly shocking, and they really are kind of chilling every time these things come out. Um, but, but but yeah, I think the conversation really has started now. There's been uh, another report recently last week. There was an, uh, an excellent uh, investigation by um, an investigative sort of body here, journalistic body here called CIPER, uh, C I P E R, which I'd also recommend people look at if they if they read Spanish. Uh, there was a, um, an investigation done where a, a policeman was found to have uh, infiltrated. Uh, 
uh, a group, a, a sort of social group in one of the, the southern districts of Santiago um, under, a, under a fake uh, identity, uh, which it turned out later the identity had been stolen from another boy who'd been arrested across, the t- uh, across town uh, that same week and they'd, uh, they'd found his wallet and stolen his identity, allegedly, at the moment. Um, and so, and so, yeah, he, he'd infiltrated this group and started to incite violence and, try, and tried to get them to attack the, uh, the local police station. So that's the kind of thing that's been rumoured, uh, you know, this was common practice or, or uh, kind of, you know, rumours heavily during the dictatorship. But also since then, since 1990, people have been talking about this for a long time, but these things are incredibly hard to report on and incredibly hard to prove. So, um, so you've always got to kind of exercise caution. But, you know, there was this, um, this case where an investigation managed to... Um, to to find that this had been the case uh, in uh, uh, here in here in Santiago, so you know that kind of thing's really worrying to find that that is actually happening. And what it's done is basically undermines the trust in the police, which they were the, the best evaluated, uh, best regarded institution in Chile uh, across you know, annually across 2015 and 2016 on average. And their respect has, has, has plummeted. People don't trust them anymore. Um, these practices uh, now we kind of now we have proof that they that they are. Um, that these things are occurring. I think people have started to see, like the uh, the images at the weekend with these churches burning. People would just say that you know that you know it's the, it's the police. They're they're burning these things to to try and frame protesters. So you know there's obviously no um, there's no proof that that's the case at the moment in that case or, or or in many of them. But you know it does it really does undermine the confidence in these uh, in these institutions. And it's it's very difficult to know how they're going to uh, recoup that without any kind of really profound reform. Wow, John, thank you so much for such a incredible detail on on these questions there's so much more we could be getting into around the concerns with human rights violations over the past year in chile but i think what you summed up right there is great for kpfa listeners we have just about a minute left the interview with you john can you share any last words um and then in particular you know to make sure again that uh, listeners have some idea about how to find you online and find your reporting in the future. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I don't think there are, there are any kind of real reflections that I haven't covered, really. I think that it's in a very important time to be looking towards Chile. Uh, obviously, the eyes of the world are going to be uh, on the final couple of weeks of the, uh, of the US presidential campaigns, of course, and that's not, you know, it's no surprise. I'm not, I'm not going to say to people that they should uh, ignore what's going on there in favour of what's happening in Chile, but I do think it's important, and I kind of outlined why I think that um, the, uh, the, the, the process that Chile is undergoing uh, is, is important globally, not just kind of uh, here, in, uh, here in Latin America and in Chile itself. So um, I think that we've got an interesting few years ahead of us. I think that, you know, the world at the moment seems to be in turmoil wherever you're looking. But I think that, you know, we can, we can look at it. Um, you, can, you can give it a positive spin as well. I think that, you know, there's, there's hope for change. People have, uh, have risen up here and, and said that their lives were un, unfair, unequal, undignified. And they've, they've basically, uh, you know, kind of come to the consensus that um, it wasn't University, po- university popular, but they've come to some kind of consensus that uh, a new constitution could be a way out of this, and you know, a, a way to a, a fairer, more democratic, and egalitarian future. So, yeah, can we get you your, to, Twitter? So, your Twitter? Your yeah, Twitter. If you want to follow my uh, my reporting in particular, and there are lots of other good people covering Chile as well, of course. But um, but yeah, I, I write mostly for the Guardian, and, and you can see me on Twitter at, um, at jw uh, bartlett b a r t l e t t ninety two. Uh, on on Twitter. So yeah, it's uh, you're welcome to, to follow me if you're interested in what's happening here. Thank you so much for having joined us, John. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. That is all for KPFA Terra Verde this week. Thanks so much to John Bartlett for joining us. Thanks to everyone who has tuned in. And many, many thanks to all the technical and program staff at KPFA that make Terra Verde possible. Be sure to look for the archive of this show and others on the web at kpfa.org. And be sure to tune in next Friday at 2 p.m. for the next edition of Terra Verde. Until then, take care of each other, be kind to yourselves, and stand firm. If you vote in California and you are trying to sort out everything below the presidential line, we are here to help. We're doing debates on the big ballot initiatives. When you look at every other place in the country, (laughs) all we want to do is just put ourselves on par with how they tax large commercial property. 
The property tax increase will mean skyrocketing rent for many small business owners. Candidate interviews for state house races. I've had 42 bills signed into law. I'm proud to be an open democratic socialist. And special reports on money in local politics. Tune in to Upfront starting at 7 a.m. If you want to browse through our coverage race by race, you can get all our election segments in a podcast feed. Just go to kpfa.org and look for California Ballot Breakdown. And remember, in California, your vote matters even more down the ballot.